do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Big thanks to our partners for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. Fastly.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. Okay, here we go. Hello and welcome to Go Time. I'm Matt Raya. Today we're talking about building a world class developer experience. You know it when you see it, when things just feel right, but it's more than just a pleasant UI or lipstick on a pig, uh, which, by the way, is a saying. I haven't just come up with that myself and just said lipstick on a pig for the first time. That's already a thing. It's not just that, though. It matters. The developer experience really matters. And we're going to dig into why that is today. We have a great panel. Chris Brando, my co-host. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Pretty good. I've got, I'm still getting over this cold, as you can hear in my voice. You know the word here. People say the word hero too easily, I think, these days. But, you know, to actually still do a podcast when you're on the tail end of a what was quite a quite a persistent little cough, a little cold. You know, yeah, I let people decide themselves. Yeah, whether that's heroic. Yeah, exactly. That's up to them, not for me to say. Well, that other voice you just heard there breaking the format was uh, Alice Merrick from the Go Team. Hello, Alice. Uh, hello, Alice. Welcome to Go Time. Thanks. <laughs> um, Alice, you were recently featured on Go For Say, the, the game show in Berlin. I was. That was me. I won. You thrashed them, didn't you? You did like <laughs> it was, really it well. It felt unfair. It felt unfair almost. I just know what Go For Say. Yeah. Exactly. We polled the audience and really Alice spends a lot of the time doing just that as well. Yeah. Um, and was able to get into their minds quite. Uh, I, I feel like that's an unfair advantage because your job is literally <laughs> understanding what go for a say. Yeah. Yeah. And do. But yeah, what they say and what they do, which is sometimes different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. OK, well, welcome back. Oh, and you're, you've been on the Go team at Google for about four years and you work on the developer experience, the user experience of go yeah that's that is what i do um and i've worked on other developer tools and things in the past and but for a while it's mostly been it's been go i've also worked a little bit on accessibility and things like that of developer tools so i've been a, i've been around it's a it's an area of interest for me mm, good well it's an area of interest for this whole episode <laughs> yeah. and it's also an area of interest for Andy Walker who is our other guest that joins us today. Hello Andy. Hello, it's good to be here. It's great to have you back. You were just on an episode, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I've been making regular appearances. I'm like a bad penny. I always turn up. <laughs> yes. But you're always welcome. I'm also kind of interested in in that's it's not my area of expertise per se, although I do have some professional experience there as well. So I'm I'm excited to I'm excited to talk about this stuff. I feel like Andy is uh, rocking the classic 80s manager of a, at a tech company look with the, the red <laughs> glasses and the mustache, getting some office space vibes. He might need a tie, you know, and pen pocket protector. This is my Santa Fe shirt. Yeah, it's very cool. At least it, it need a tie or at least a shirt that has a tie printed on it. Right, like printed on it. Yeah. Yeah. That'd with a pocket protector. Oh, yeah. man. Otherwise, you've got these unsecure pockets. Mm. It's dangerous stuff. Okay, let's get into this then. What do we mean by a, a developer experience? What, what literally is that and why does it matter? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about that if you want somebody to jump in. Yes, generally, Alice, just jump in. No <laughs> just need jump to, in? Yeah, All right. go for it. Yeah. All right, yeah. So typically, like user experiences is what you think about as your the experience of the people who are using the thing that you're building, right? So maybe you're building a consumer end product or an enterprise kind of product, and you think of the people who are buying that or using that as your users. And maybe you're thinking about uh, how easy it is for them to get something done. Maybe you're thinking about how productive they can be or how happy they are using it. Uh, and so that's typically what we think about when we think about UX, but when it comes to developer experience, sometimes we forget that developers are actually users too. Uh, you're using tools, you know, that uh, 
you know, other people build for you or design for you. You're using languages and platforms and um, there's a whole ecosystem around that. And so, you know, don't forget that even as a developer, you also have an experience of either building things and using tools and collaborating with other people. And, you know, that's just as important to getting things built, you know. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point that you make because we sort of the whole web 2.0 movement sold us on user experience having to be good. And actually, sometimes you see products beat other products just because the experience is better. It's not even doesn't even necessarily have as many features or whatever. In fact, sometimes that that can be how they do it. Yeah, so but we've some I guess in the past neglected maybe developer because we assume pro user you know, they can get into the command line and they can even look at the code if they're not sure. But I don't know, the times when I've had projects that have been successful has always been when we've paid particular attention to that developer experience from the very first, how, how they discover your product or project, how do they get it going with it? How much investment do they have to put in before they get some kind of payback from it? And how can we reduce that kind of stuff? The episode that Andy was on, last time was about tools and this kind of came up a lot didn't it Andy like the the develop the actual experience of using the tools often was what made us like them yeah yeah I mean uh, the one of the I think primary examples was some of the the suite of command line tools from from charm who pay particular attention to like you know their design the term that I I keep finding myself using is like you know, something ergonomics, like developer ergonomics or like visual ergonomics, you know, things that more than just convey information, but do so in a comfortable and I guess more importantly, intuitive way and can kind of have a, like a, ideally like some sort of multimodal, you know, experience if at all possible. Yeah. That's really interesting stuff. Yeah. What do you mean the multimodal experience? What I mean to, is basically... So we talked about this a little bit last time, but I read a while back that, um, you know, our brains are not as parallel as we would like them to be. Um, they're really very serial. And so there's only kind of this small window of experience that like we're going to be like actively conscious of and like, you know, having discursive reasoning about at any one time. Whereas there is this entire wide bandwidth kind of, input of other senses of other, you know, stimulus that nonetheless will shape our experience in ways that we may not be like actually consciously pondering at that time. And so as much of that as you can kind of take advantage of, I feel is like a good thing. Mm. Yeah. So in tools, this is like, if there's already a standard pattern for something, go along with that pattern, you have the inertia of people already using it. And you get to then kind of take them with you and you get a kind of head start. And I think a lot of the Unix tools and like the way that you can pipe things together, like these kinds of became very familiar. But I think it also applies in Go when you're writing APIs, like that's a developer experience, of course, a Go interface and the thing you expose in your package. That is also a big part of developer experience. And yeah, how can you, how can you get that to be also as good and as slick and as simple and as clear as possible? Yeah. And just to add more to, you know, now I think we've kind of established what it is, why it's so important is, I mean, that's how you, that's what allows you to build things at either at a speed that you need to, or with a high level of impact or satisfaction. Like you don't necessarily want all the, all the developers in your organization to be unhappy or to feel like, you know, they can't accomplish the things they want to accomplish. And if your end product, like if your if your product is a developer tool, you know, then for business purposes, it's also very important. If you have a poor, you know, any kind of poor UX, that's not going to, you know, necessarily be the best selling tool out there or the best or the most used tool out there. So, yeah, just to add on. I think for uh, for tools as well, especially like tools that developers use a lot, like even small changes to UIs or the API of it can have like massive effects that I think also 
are generally not accounted for by businesses well enough where it's just like like I think maybe a good example of this is how there's still like a huge number of people that use old.reddit.com for people that are still using Reddit. And it's because of like the they just got so used to the way that everything worked in that flow that like the new one just doesn't work for them. And I think there's like lots of little examples of that with tools where it's like, oh, we like did some research and here's a new UI that's going to be like this much better. And everybody's like, oh, no, this is actually like it's going to mess me up. This is going to take me a long time to learn this. And it's like not the trade off just isn't as worth it. Yeah, that's a that's actually an interesting problem that you just brought up called change aversion which we don't have to go into a lot of detail now, but basically that is the notion that like anytime you change something, people are going to be, you know, averse or have negative feelings about it just because it's different. Even if it is better in some way, they are going to have some negative feelings about that. And it can be hard to tease apart whether or not it was because your design change was actually a poor design choice or whether it's just like, well, it's just this like initial like change of version and eventually people will get over it or some people will get over it. <laughs> yeah, it, it has a, a surprising source sometimes, I think, too. Like there's a bit of a perverse incentive to, you know, keep driving innovation and change for it, especially for like software that, you know, doesn't have like it's sad, I know. But like this is something I heard um, my girlfriend works for an architecture software uh, company. And, you know, a lot of that world of very like niche software, if they don't have a subscription model, especially like they often feel like compelled to make these like big changes so that people will, you know, upgrade. And so then you get a lot of these like, oh, we researched this and like it's so streamlined now. And it's just it's kind of funny to me because there have I do believe that there are or have been some, you know, nearly perfect UIs in the past that just got, you know ruined by being re rehashed you know so does this mean we're we're trapped like whichever version of your software that gets popular are we trapped in that moment yeah you said you can never make any changes ever <laughs> <laughs> no it, i i don't think so but the the thing is you do have to be sensitive and you do have to make trade-offs and one way that you can look at whether or not it was actually a, a good design choice is by looking at people who are new to that tool or product and and comparing between, you know, hey, are people who are new to this, do they think that this is, you know, the best thing since, you know, automatic slice bread or, or are they also struggling? Because if people who are new to it are struggling as much as people who are like, well, now I have to unlearn the old thing, then that's when you know you have problems. So as somebody who's like a little bit like, well, who's way more involved in this professionally than I am. That makes me kind of curious. Is there some sort of like decent or objective measure from for like, say, time to fluency, right, that you can use in a case like that? Just kind of curious. Yeah, you could absolutely set up a metric for success that was like, we need people to be able to start using this. They need to be able to get up and running in one day. You know, and if people are ma- meeting that, like if people can w- accomplish whatever goal that is in one day, then like, boom, you know, yeah, then it's a success. And but if it's taking people longer than that, then, OK, we might need to rethink either our success metric or rethink our design. So but yeah, I mean, uh, is there like is there a gold standard of like, oh, it should everyone should be able to start using a thing in one hour or one day or one month or one year? Nah, not really. It depends. Right. I was just kind of curious, like, um, if you'd run across anything like that. Or, like, I would imagine that if you've dealt with these kind of experience and accessibility changes or overhauls before, there's got to be some kind of measure that... Because if, you know, it can be very deflating as a software developer to spend a lot of time on something, you know, workshop it even, and then come out with it and people don't like the new experience. They want the old experience back. So, like... Or worse than deflating, it can, you know, mean that, um, you know, you lose buy-in or, or something like that. Yeah. There are things you can do oh, yeah? to make it a little easier. Yeah, see, that's where we're going yeah. with this. There, yeah. There, there are things that you can, ha- you can do to help people kind of adapt to whatever the new change is, right? Especially is um, – because sometimes a change is necessary, especially if it's like there was a security issue here, right? Like we can't always have things uh, remain the same. Sometimes things really do need to change. Like, for example, if they forgot to make the password box 
hide the actual password and it, instead yeah it no that would be it, real bad said it spoke it out loud yeah just one of those classic bugs and i was like oh well, that's how i entered my password before i would just say it out loud and you know it would text to speech it for me or whatever yeah you're gonna <laughs> make some people angry uh yeah <laughs> yeah right you're gonna you're gonna break somebody's somebody's flow there yeah i mean you know and depending on what it is like maybe you've got some tool that migrates your workflow from this tool to this tool or something or maybe you have uh yeah i know i, I see like kind of lots of you know uh, that hasn't worked well for me in the past yeah i mean there but th like there are things that you can do that are like that you can have documentation of like here was the old way here's the new way here's why we changed it you know, you can also have like a, hey, try out the new way, uh, but without deprecating the old way yet. And then it's like you give people like a really long like, all right, you've got one year, you've got, you know, six months, you've got, you know, whatever, like, or you can go in between them uh, to kind of explore and while they're still maybe iterating on the new design or whatever, like you don't have, it doesn't always have to be like a very, you know, all right, now everyone, everyone was ver using version two. Now everyone must use version three tomorrow. Like, uh, that would be a disaster. I feel like there's also like, uh, I guess I extend what you said there. I think there's a business perspective that often gets missed where it's just like, even if we are building a new thing, we should be prepared if people don't like it and we need to keep the old thing alive. Yeah. Like, I feel like that happens a lot with like greenfield projects where it's like, this old thing is terrible. We're going to do this greenfield thing. It's going to be better. We're going to launch this new thing. And then you're still stuck having to maintain the old thing and run it for like seven years because you didn't yeah. anticipate something. I feel like the same thing happens with a lot of user experiences or interfaces and things like that, where it's like, oh, we thought that we'd just be able to replace the whole thing, but we didn't actually understand our users enough and how they use our product to actually be able to pull off this migration or this change. Right. Yeah. That's the, And that's the importance of having a, a UX kind of baked into your process there mm. so that, you know, you're not building a thing for no one. Yeah, <laughs> I think I have the opposite of change aversion. Like, I love it when things change and it's hard again. I quite like hard things that I then have to spend time and kind of figure out. So you must change your key bindings like every day then. <laughs> well, I change my keyboard a lot. I do have now a new keyboard that I got. This is a Keychron Q10. I built one of those. A Q10? Yeah, well, an, an Arisu style, yeah. Yeah. I actually have a Keychron as well. What kinds of things do you like to see uh, change? Because I imagine there are some that you wouldn't want to change. Yeah, I like fonts to change. I love a, <gasps> love a different <laughs> font. Gives a whole new yeah. meaning to the code. No, the code meaning stays the same, but it looks different. And I, I take it. Colors, changing the colors in the IDE. Yeah. I think that's quite a nice way to sort of, you know freshen up your life some people have got like i don't know th interests that keeps their life interesting yeah but but if not changing your ide colors is a great way to it's like a, a fresh lick of paint in your in your office yeah it's kind of like fashion like we wouldn't want to keep wearing the same things we wore in 1998 yeah andy oh. <laughs> you know it's it's funny that you call me out here because like i <laughs> On the one hand, I rotate fonts like I rotate crops in a field. But like on the other, you know, I, I do. I mean, another thing that I mentioned the last time is that, uh, you know, I was my life was just changed forever when I learned that um, the default for at least for the at the time for MacBooks was to have non integer scaling. And if you just ticked it up one, you could get, you know, crisper pixels again, which is like, but like, I, st I still miss like bitmap fonts, you know, it's just, they're not really possible to get anymore. I, I tried to, I tried to make my own and to, you know, moderate success. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I do kind of still pine for that old sort of crispness in fonts while at the same time, like just basically continuously searching for like the, the perfect font for me. We'll have to do a font episode. Oh, really? yeah. I'm 100% in. Yeah, podcast episode <laughs> on fonts. Yeah, definitely. Uh, or maybe like a, an episode about typography. Because I, I was actually reading this uh, this article. I was, I was down this rabbit hole of like Fediverse stuff. I was reading this one. Uh, I think it's like uh, MacWrite.com, I think is the website. But he had this post about how he made his website super duper fast. And one of the things he mentioned is that he at first started with web fonts, but then decided to go with system default fonts. And I was like, that sounds like a terrible idea. But then he's like, 
it's not the font that matters that much as uh, well, it's, the font matters, but not as much as the rest of the typography and all of the other changes that you want to make to make the thing more readable. And I was like, oh, no, that's that's brilliant. Yeah. Like do all the stuff in CSS to make it so that it's a good reading experience and then just use default fonts and like can make it so people can configure, you know, pretty web fonts if you want or nicer web fonts. But I was like, that's that's a good, good piece of advice right there. And it would probably, it might be, if it makes it faster, then that might be a, a better experience. Yeah. Yeah. Not having to load as much web font and, and also not have the user experience of like the flash of like unstyled content or like, oh, it's one font and then it shifts to another and it messes up your scroll position and all that. Oh, it sounds like real annoying. And it's like, it's, it's just a system font. You don't got to worry about that. And system fonts these days are pretty good. Like Helvetica is not a bad font, right? It's. It's, it's a pretty nice font, or I guess typeface. The font is the, whatever, pedantic. But it's, it's a good typeface. It's really about contrast, as I understand it. I was talking to, I was, I got, I started this project a while back to like make like a, I guess like the most science backed color scheme I could come up with. And I, I started, I like reached out to a bunch of like ophthalmologists and, and basically I like looked up papers and, you know, wrote to people and I ended up getting a couple of people to write me back and they, they were like, look, it doesn't matter what your base color is. It matters how much contrast you have. Like, you know, black text on white, white text on black. One may or may not be objectively better than the other, but not really. It's really just about like contrasts. Right. And after that, you know, WCAG <laughs> guidelines and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, of course, there are some colors that aren't easily seen by people mm -hmm. who are colorblind and things like that. Some levels of visual acuity might require higher contrast. So you want to make sure you're ticking all the baselines. But after that, then yeah, you it is kind of a matter of taste and also a matter of fashion, you know, because these things also change over time. Yeah, I always like to store my secrets. I always write it down in non-colorblind friendly colors just in case. The person spying on me. Is yeah, colorblind. you never know. One in eight people won't be able to read it. It's more secure than whatever it is you're doing, Alice, with your secrets. <laughs> I don't know where you're putting them. I don't. I don't write mine down. Ah, clever. <laughs> They're secret even to myself. <laughs> you don't even know them. <laughs> she knows them in her dreams, right? So she's got to like. Yeah. It's a good place to store them. To be fair. Yeah. Can't rely yeah. on it though. But uh, so there are a couple of things that we mentioned. I don't know if we want to move on to talking about like what actually makes a really good developer experience. There was something that we mentioned is a good visual design, but you don't always have a visual design, especially if you're using like a maybe just a plain command line tool. But we talked about like speed. That was another thing, something that is that is fast. You know, you want it to be responsive. Uh, you don't want to wait for something to just load to show you some animation. Uh <laughs> like, oh, look, it fades in and out or whatever. But yeah, I'm curious, any of your other thoughts about like what makes a um, a good developer experience? I think if it's one where you can guess and you, and you generally make a good, like you, you can make good guesses, I think that's great. I always, I'm a big believer in documentation, mm -hmm. but the goal of an interface for me is that you don't need the docs because it's clear, or you can guess in a safe way and you've communicated that, Yes, you might be able to like click this delete thing, but you can undo it or it puts it in somewhere else. Like if you can sort of show that, let people try things and those kind of tactile experiences I like. The thing, the, the one that winds me up the most is the cookie pop up, the annoying accept my cookies thing. It's so annoying. And it's like, you've got like accept, reject. It's like sometimes, yeah. you know, sometimes it's like I accidentally, I've run out of time. I was in a rush. And I got into some like advanced settings of the cookies thing now. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a, uh, you have the option to accept what the, the default, just accept all the cookies, whatever yeah. they want to give you, reject them all. Yeah. Or, or select which ones, you know, uh, yeah. And get in there. That's a hostile user interface as far as I'm concerned, like deliberately. So yeah, it really is in my, in my opinion, I, I think that something needs to change there about like what the default options are. I especially hate the ones that are gigantic because sometimes they'll be like on my phone and I want to preview a link and like in Safari, you can just like hold down a link, it pops up. It's like, oh, okay, like I want to see the whole title for this article, so I'll hold it down. But then like the entire thing is blocked by this gigantic, for some reason, cookie consent form. And I'm like, 
why? Like, please stop. <laughs> like, I don't want to have to navigate fully. Like, very deliberate. Yeah, and, and like part of it is like a legal issue. Is I think that is you know why we have that. Yeah, I, what was it the EU? It was like California and the EU were like, oh, there's. It started with just the cookie consent things, right? Where it's like, oh, you have to tell yeah. people it uses cookies, and I feel like yeah. every UX person was like, great, now you've just taught all the users to just randomly click OK on something to make it go away on the page. Like this is terrible, yeah. and I was mad enough about that, and now there's this other thing that's like, oh, please, like configure our ability to track you and whatnot, and I'm like, oh. yeah. I would like to say one more thing about developer, like good developer experience uh, to kind of pivot off of what Matt said and made me think of this. To me, um, yes, it's obviously like the interface that is 100% intuitive is best, but, and kind of also related to APIs. There's like, an, there is, a, there is like with a good IDE, there is a kind of, combined with good design, there is a kind of API ergonomics that like dovetails with documentation, right? So. You know, I think I need, I know I need to do something with like this auth policy here. And so then I just type a dot. I do this, you know, all the time. And then if you get a good, like intelligent list of completions, you can very quickly make something quite complex that you've never seen before and understand what it does just by like little piecemeal docs as you kind of go along. To me, that is almost perfection, right? Like, and it's, to me, it's actually even better than, some of the AI autocomplete stuff because it sticks more. Like the little, the tiny little steps that you have to go through, like just looking at documentation really quick, each section, like you remember more, it works better. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I also like documentation that is interactive in some way. And I've built a few of these before myself where we would teach you about the, this, there was a particular product and it had an API and it was an API. That was the tool. It was like in a Docker container. And we would teach you about the API by letting you actually use it. And you sort of follow a story. So it's like a story told. Mm. And then it's like, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna try this thing first with this empty box and it doesn't know anything, and then we're gonna teach it something, and then we're gonna see that it's learned that, you know, and each of the steps you get back a payoff. So you invest a bit of time, and the deal was you invest some time, we'll pay back with something fun or interesting, some kind of progress. And that worked out really well. We found that people would just go through the flow because it was fun and, and kind of enjoyable. And I think sometimes just tweaking language, like the way that you communicate uh, and the tone that you communicate with people can sometimes uh, make a big difference. But it's we're building for an international audience, so it's uh, tough to get that right, probably. So it sounds like, was the... API itself very usable, like not just the like documentation, but was the, the API itself. Yeah, well, in a way, this was designed from the perspective of, of this story. Uh, and it's a bit like how TDD can sometimes drive your design, often drives your design of what, what it, your package is and what you're exposing. Almost like the document-driven thing. This was our the way that people would learn about this API, informed what the API design was. And I think that's also... It's a bit of, you know, applying sort of UX principles generally. Like, think about the user. What, what are they doing? Like, what are they feeling at this time as well? I'm working on an incident tool at the moment in Grafana Labs. And incidents are a time when people are really stressed out. So we have to deliberately be a much simpler tool to use than some of the other pro tools that Grafana has. And it's really about understanding that what people are doing, what they're feeling at that moment. That sounds like... Like, I think when I started my career, thinking about like how people are feeling using the software would have sounded a bit like, Woo. Uh, I, I probably, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> have perhaps respected it as much as like, it's so, it's paramount now. It's really, it's like, if you can cheer people up, if you can solve their problem, like this is, this is like, we get, we know we get joy from this kind of stuff. It's fun. Yeah. I feel like that's. That kind of idea is what made Swagger, now OpenAPI, so popular, is it was like, well, here's really good looking documentation that you can just run. And I think there's a lot of advantages to that sort of thing. If you, if you do it right, I think a lot of people do all of it very poorly. Like they just, they 
they'll give you a specification that doesn't even work. It'll be like, oh, it doesn't run through the validator properly. But I think when you do that well, it does feel like this like easy experience getting acquainted with even what can be a complex API because it's just like, oh, here's some examples. Here's what to expect. And it kind of like guides you to all of the information you need to provide to someone to actually be able to use the thing. Yeah, structured representation of information, you know, can go quite a long way in, in at least in, in aiding, you know, understanding. Yeah. Andy, I can't imagine what your life's like. What do you mean? Just, just like you going about your day doing normal things. I can't imagine it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Neither can the people that live with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just imagine Andy just like, oh, I'm going to go into this bookshop and then I'm going to go into a coffee shop and just do some normal things. Didn't compute for work for some reason. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like always like, I, I, I guess for me, there's like this, always this underlying sense that I could be doing better or like, I don't know. I, I can't stop thinking about like the, both like the, the intersection of between like, you know, the way that we have built the world and the way that like maybe, and all of this like stuff that we're kind of like hardwired to take in and how to like pay attention to that and, and, and use that kind of heuristic stuff a little bit better. Yeah. It's really interesting to me. No. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's it's like using data, like to make these decisions is an interesting point. And Alice, what are some of the things that, that you hear the most about Go's user experience and developer experience? Well, I, I mean, I, who lots, where do I begin? Uh, I mean, I could talk about like reasons why, what people like about Go, you know, people say it's very simple. It's easy to learn, you know, it's, uh, oh, it's easy to deploy everywhere. It's, oh, single executable. I can put it, you know, like it's just easy. Um, some people also like, you know, really are into GoFumped and the fact that, oh, hey, actually, it's really easy to maintain this and share, like have a shared code base with somebody when all our code looks the same. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so the language and then also like the tooling, those are some of the, the things that, that we hear about, like as far as, uh, you know, really good experiences are going. So... If I mean, if you have more and more to gush about on the Go developer experience, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I do think it does a good job. When I learned it, it was very, it was all very lo-fi. It felt like a kind of small open source project. So it was like static sites, and and actually all that stuff in itself was also very simplistic, which mirrored really Go, and and kind of was what attracted me to it, honestly. I think the fact that we have the in-browser in playground, I think, is is really cool. You can just go and yeah, start. Yeah, I want to hear about that. I am so fascinated into how people use this and why. Because something I found out recently is that actually a lot, like a lot of the traffic to the go.dev website is for that playground. And I have very little understanding of what people are using it for. But I have heard that people use it to like possibly like share code snippets with other people. But like what, how do you use it in your like day to day? Is it something you learn to use or experiment or like what's going on when you're using that? Yeah, I actually use it to sketch out ideas sometimes when I'm talking about things. And sometimes that can be collaborative and sometimes not. It's quicker to open the playground than it is to create a file and go and edit it especially if i've got already tooling and ides and stuff around i can't just go and easily create a file in there and make a mess because then it's like oh it doesn't build anymore isn't it like amazing too like i i i use it all the time and i like i've deliberately tried not to like i've tried to like set it up in such a way that i don't do that because well, like you blocked it like put an adult filter block on it or something how have you stopped yourself from using it <laughs> trying to wean well, yourself uh, off <laughs> yeah i mean if you really think about it it's it's like a completely different experience. Like you're not, it doesn't do, you know, any kind of, I mean, it doesn't bother me, but it doesn't do any kind of syntax highlighting. It looks, I mean, it's basically Acme. It doesn't do auto indent until you like save it or run it. Right. And it's just, it's a completely like very bare bones experience. And so like, I've like actively tried to like, okay, how do I get this? Like, why do I like this? And how do I get it? Like in a way that's not, you know, that's similar to what I'm actually doing. And I still, you know, end up using it for like quick one-offs or like if I'm brain farting about syntax or whatever, like I'll just open the site, type things in. I don't even care that it's not getting indented. I'm like, it'll be fine. Right. And then, 
But I think you're right. Like the, basically the ability to more or less click a button and then that's it, right? It just, it, it will run. And if there's something wrong with it, you'll see it is pretty valuable. And like, you know, of course the reproducibility too is nice, but like it's fast, like you say, and it's just there. <laughs> I, I feel like it's the equivalent of like a scratch pad. So it's like, you know, sometimes you're like working on something, you just need like a little scratch piece of paper to write something down on. And like, I feel like when you, if you wanted to do that locally, you would have to like commit to like a file somewhere you have to put someplace. And that just like pulls you out of whatever you were just trying to do. So you got like, oh, well, where am I going to go put this? Oh, I got to name it properly. How do I run this thing again? So you got to like go run it, especially if you have a folder where you put all these things. Like, oh, got to go run this specific file. But with the playground, it's just like, no, I just open it up, type play dot whatever, whatever. And then I'm off to the races and I can run it and then I can go back to whatever I was doing. It has a very tight loop and I can just throw it away when I'm done. And there's not this commitment that I have that I would have with, you know, something else that I want to use. And it drops you right into main, right? Like just everything's like, you're ready to go. You're just there, right? There's like, you don't even have to type a skeleton or anything. You can just start. I don't even have to name the thing. It's just, yeah. Boom. Yeah. So Andy, you, you mentioned that you tried not to use playground. Yeah. And I'm curious, why not? It sounds like it's great. <laughs> it, I know it is. It's just that like, it does have shortcomings, right? Like the fact mm -hmm. that it doesn't, you know, first of all, if it's more than just like exploratory, like if I'm dashing off a syntax idea or like, you know, something involving like the rules of the language that I want to like mess around with or test if it involves like a library, if it involves anything like that, then it is, it takes longer. Like if I mm. want to do an example that uses even more than one file, anything like that, or even an example that like crosses package boundaries, there's this, you know, kind of abstruse uh, syntax that you have to use to do that kind of thing. And so that's when I've, I've wanted something similar, but there's really nothing that does it quite the same way. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, is there anything about it being in the browser itself that is vital to the experience? Or if you could do this like locally in your IDE, like what if you, you know, what if it was easy to just create a, you know, piece of scratch paper, as you will, like in your favorite editor, would you do that instead? Yes. Um, as long as it had some kind of even if somewhat limited persistence, right? Because there is, there is a mode of working, right? It's the, the coding equivalent of having, like being like the novelist who has a bunch of sticky pads or whatever, right? Like there is this mode of working like that. And, you know, you need the kind of permanence of it there to like refer to, but yes, I absolutely would. Yeah, I think that's the nice thing about the playground is that you can, if you want to save it and put it yes. somewhere. But yeah, I think like uh, you kind of, hit the nail right in the head there, Alice, because I was just thinking about how it'd be a cool thing to build of a tool that's like literally like a cult scratch pad or whatever. That is this thing where it's just like, oh, I want to just sketch something out real quick. And it lets you do that quick. Like I'm just roughing out some syntax or I'm just like trying to figure out what I mean here. But could also to I think your point, Andy, make it so you could extend it a little bit further to bring in external packages. Uh, and maybe even bringing things that you have locally so that you can do like a little bit more, not getting all the way up to like a full IDE or full editor, but kind of fit that space. Because I do think there is a gap that exists right now where it's like, well, I want to use this, but I, I want to import another package. And technically the playground does support it, but there's kind of there's a lot of limitations around that. So if I could just have that locally and have this like little space be filled, I think that would be like great. I think it'd be kind of the equivalent of what like, the what Jupyter notebooks or Python notebooks gave for like a lot of data scientists and people like that, where it's just like, or what REPLs gave for a lot of languages, where it's just like, oh, I can just start roughing things out. So it's like a little bit like a REPL for Go, but a little bit more robust. Yeah, I've got a script that gets me pretty close. Like I have a very robust, like literally dev slash scratch, right? And everything under scratch, I mean, most things under scratch is a single directory that's like a, has a Go mod in it. And it's just something I wanted to screw around with. And so I have like a script that like will create a new scratch, like initialize the Go mod with the name of the directory, create a main format and then open code and like drop me in there and it'll jump to like the first line. That's pretty close. Nice. 
Yeah. There you go. Should open source. Have that. you shared that with anyone? Yeah. No, no, I never have. Yeah, I really probably should. There you go. Look at us doing UX work and covering <laughs> gaps in the community. Tools that apparently already exist, but Andy is hoarding them all. <laughs> I, I really want, A, I want Charm to make this because then it'd be <laughs> absolutely beautiful. But I also like uh, another, I guess, idea of this. I wonder if you could just like integrate this into Go Please and have this be like a, a thing an LSP can do. So you could just do it from your editor. So your editor could open up a new window or buffer or whatever that's just like, boom, ready to go. And then you can just start scratching it, uh, you know, doing all of that notating or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, and then choose to like save it or whatever, get rid of it. Maybe it like keeps stuff around for a day or whatever. You can configure it and it garbage collects. Like you could, you could really integrate this, but that would be a real nice thing. Cause then all of the editors that already integrate with Please, it's like, oh, it's already, it's already there. So it can work. So you don't have to go into some other editor or go into some other thing. I mean, it's kind of easy to do this on the command line. Cause you just be like, oh, what's your editor? I'll run it for you that. But if you're using like, you know, VS code or Goland or whatever, that might be a little bit more difficult. So, LSP integration. I have to bring this to the Go Please team. Yeah, we're just pitching. We're just pitching things we want to Alice now. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but bit of a bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, at the tables of turn, you thought I was joining your show. You're joining mine. <laughs> oh, we just research people. <laughs> This is a changelog news break. We've talked about prompt injection quite a bit since ChatGPT ushered in the LLM era. In brief, that's where you handcraft a prompt that tricks a chatbot into not following its own rules. Well, new research has uncovered some new LLM attacks on the block which aren't exactly that. Quote, large language models like ChatGPT... Bard, or Claude undergo extensive fine-tuning to not produce harmful content in their responses to users' questions. Although several studies have demonstrated so-called jailbreaks, which are special queries that can still induce unintended responses, these require a substantial amount of manual effort to design and can often easily be patched by LLM providers. This work studies the safety of such models in a more systematic fashion we demonstrate that it is in fact possible to automatically construct adversarial attacks on LLMs, specifically chosen sequences of characters that, when appended to a user query, will cause the system to obey user commands even if it produces harmful content. End quote. The biggest difference here is that they're achieving the jailbreak in an entirely automated fashion, and they make a case for the possibility that such behavior may never be fully patchable by LLM providers. It's game over, man. It's game over. What are we going to do now? What are we going to do? You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. The go backwards compatibility promise that you have that extra constraint on the user experience. Of course, you have to always bear that in mind. Um, and usually we have to live with our legacy decisions. That's a great example of that. But I was interested in what mistakes we can do or, or what mistakes happen a lot or things we can do to avoid them if there's any common sort of pitfalls or bits of ux that we don't like we talked about the cookie one as well i think another is where products add loads and loads and loads of features mm. and then yes it's more powerful it can do all these things but it actually becomes harder to use because these features are now sort of in your way if you don't need them. Yeah, and then uh, you might have to deprecate them and that would violate some kind of, you know, somebody's expectations. It'll annoy somebody, won't it? Well, orthogonality, right, is important. With you know, if you have, you can have too, so many features that have so much overlap and then, you know. Yeah, I mean, one thing you can do is not add so many features to begin with, which I, okay, so I understand the desire to just keep building things. Uh, and there's, you know, like building things is fun. Like 
building things that are really cool and people like new features, right? Like the, and so there is a, uh, a lot of a desire and drive even, you know, internally and externally to build more features, but you really have to put a very critical lens on before you, you know, before you build something. So one little allegory we like to give is if you ask somebody, uh, what flavor of ice cream do they like or what kind do they, you know, what flavor should we have available? You're going to hear every single flavor. Everybody wants every flavor of ice cream that you can conceive of. All right. But like you can't just give everybody whatever flavor of ice cream they like. You might have to limit this to like what are the top three? You know, what are the maybe and maybe you go by preference like maybe you also go by, okay, dietary restrictions. Like this is a common allergen. So maybe we don't use the peanut one or maybe we don't have, or maybe we have a dairy-free option as well, right? So like you can put different kinds of criteria on how you uh, select for what features or things you're going to make available. And, you know, part of it can be accessibility. Part of it can be what is the core task of the tool. It can be helpful to just really focus on the core, what we, we like to call them CUJs, but you can also think of them as like jobs to be done, user journeys, things like that. You have these like core tasks that you want your tool to be able to do. And you want that tool to do those things as good and like like have the smoothest, most frictionless experience like possible for those core things. And you can sort of limit some of that other stuff because if like somebody's like, oh, well, I really want to be able to do this. And it's like, yeah, I know you want to be able to do that, but that's not what this tool is for. That's a different tool. And you can happily go build that tool. We, we would love that tool to exist. It's just not our tool. So there are ways that you can you can do that. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I do see that happen all the time with feature creep is so oh, it can do everything. <laughs> yeah. So I have I have a couple of really interesting things that you made me kind of think about there. Um, what the first thing that occurred to me is like, I think there's also like a temperance that comes in with like that comes with the experience to a degree. I mean, I think everybody craves that like the kind of joy of forging forward new creation and stuff like that. But like the more that you do this kind of work, like I used to be a big Perl developer and I couldn't tell you the number of times that like they would start something, add some feature and then like, oh no, that does not, that has some weird cross side effect thing. We're deprecating it, right? So this thing that was like this new core shiny feature that I loved so much, like two releases later, it would be deprecated. And like, then eventually it's removed because it just had too many, you know, side effects o over time you start to realize that like you know once you the more the more things you add them the less orthogonal they are the more complicated things become and very quickly like the, the in a frankenstein sort of way the joy of creation can turn to like horror right but mm -hmm. yeah i do think there's something in that also thinking about what problems can be solved in user land and is there something you can do which unlocks a lot of other capabilities are that that definitely resonates with me where if you can enable, you really, with developer tools especially, trying to enable people to do things, is there something you can do in your design to enable more of that? And that's just a worthwhile question. You know, it's nice to solve your specific problems, but if you can find an abstraction that just just fits perfectly there. I mean, that's really the, the gold. That's when you struck gold. I have an analogy I feel like might also fit here, where I feel like features are a bit like sugar or fat, where like you, you need to have them, right? You need to have them to live, but the delivery method of them is what matters the most, right? You want to make sure it's balanced. You don't want to have too much of it. Uh, you know, sometimes it might be good to deliver your sugar as junk food, and we all kind of like that. But it, you can't make your entire diet out of junk food, or you don't want to make your entire diet all sugar or no fat, or like remove all the fat and only have sugar. And I feel like features are are quite a bit like that. And I feel like especially for like the old model, but like before we had this nice subscription model where you had this nice stream of like, we can slowly give you features. And you had the big bang thing. You had to like really put in a ton of equivalent of sugar and fat into that to get people to actually want to eat the thing because it was like such an expensive purchase as opposed to like these nice subscription models where it's like, okay, I'm paying for over time now, but now the company doesn't feel the need to kind of push all this extra stuff on me to incentivize me to consume it. Yeah. That's, you know, that's really, oh, well, go ahead, Andy. Oh, it's for you. It's for you oh, actually. Um, yeah. it's, 
So here's the thing. Um, I w- I've been thinking about this recently because there's, I think, you know, creating new features is great and everything, but, you know, to use the, I guess, like to use the, the food analogy, like you can spend your life like perfecting, you know, an omelet or like something very simple. And I think, you know, it's easy to forget that there's like a lot of work that, that can go into like very subtly adjusting and perfecting like a tool that you really have no intention of like adding a whole bunch of new features to per se. And I was wondering like, if you, you know, have any experience, I think Go is a wonderful example of that actually, because like we have this language that has by many accounts of positive features, right? But, you know, nonetheless is still undergoing like constant refinement in areas like say, you know, type parameter inference and stuff like that, right? So just wondering like, you know, what, what, you, what you have to say about that, like especially working on the experience of a language that is so static. Yeah. So let me see if I can kind of get an idea of what your actual question is, is like, how do we balance that? Like the new features versus perfecting old features or existing features? Or how do you allocate your time? Yeah, yeah, really. So, I mean, there's o- we're always going to try to make the things better that we do well, right? That's like, we do well here and we want to keep doing well here because this is kind of like our, our core, it aligns with our core design philosophy. Uh, it aligns with our like core values and, and what we want people to be able to do. So that's going to be a thing that we always work on. When it comes to new features, really part of it comes down to what is going to, one, something that Chris said is like, you know, how to unlock people and, and different kinds of, I think it was Chris was t- talking about this, like how can you uh, unlock, you know, different capabilities But also, sometimes it's not about building new features to get new users or new use cases. Sometimes it's just removing friction from the existing tool or existing feature. Just remove some friction there. Like, what if we just made this feature a little easier to discover or a little easier to use? And so in that case, sometimes you are iterating on, you know, that particular thing, that particular feature. You are iterating on that in a way that, makes it, you're unblocking people from using it instead of building a new thing. Because actually what I find is that it's not just new features that attract people to a tool or a product. It's how easy is it to do a thing? How easy is it to get started or how easy is it to build, right? It's that experience, not just the like, oh, but I can you know, and this one lets me do this, you know, it's like, you're probably like, maybe you'd buy that tool, but are you going to use it? Like, probably not. (laughs) You know, it's the things that makes it easy, not the thing that does all the things. I feel that's like uh, spicing or roasting your veggies. It's like, yeah, you know, they're good for you. They don't have to taste terrible. And we should figure out how to like, you know, make it so people actually want to consume them and not just, you know. Yeah, you can, you can actually just like really do your veggies just like really well. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Good idea. Well, speaking of doing your veggies really well, it's time for Unpopular Opinions. Well, we have a great panel today, a.k.a. Alice, Chris, Andy... Literally A K A. Literally. It is that. Who wants to go first? Alice, have you got an unpopular opinion? Yeah. Oh, I have so many, but I will share one Mm -hmm. because, you know, got to fit them all in. I have an unpopular opinion about self driving cars. Okay. And some people think self driving cars will be great and they're going to save us all. Some people think that it's too hard of a technical problem to solve. I think that self driving cars are just a bad idea because they're not actually solving a real human problem. Mm, aren't they? No, I think that for people who like driving, you're taking away their driving. And for people who don't like driving, there you can also invest in public transit. So there's really no, like I can't think of like, either either you drive or you don't, but either way, it's not really, not solving a core user need there. We have alternatives. People that like driving, though, in the self-driving cars can get one of those Apple Vision Pros and can play like Asphalt 8 or something, and they can be driving. While they're driving. Well, exactly. I mean, 
But like that's not like a real human need though. Right. Like that's not it's just not tri- that's and that's my argument. It's just like there's no real there's no real need. It's just I mean definitely it, it will, you know, uh create generate lots of data. It'll, you know, increase car dependency. It'll like definitely make a lot of money for someone. But I just don't think it's trying to solve a real human need. Yeah, that's an interesting one there. That's a tough one to argue with, but that's not going to stop us. Does anyone want to <laughs> dispute that? <laughs> I mean, I've always thought of it as kind of like an unfortunate stopgap. Like, I mean, if we want to get utopian about it, my like, first of all, like most of this whole country was designed thinking that gasoline will be cheap and plentiful forever. Right. And like (laughs) everyone will have a car and it will be great. And then so now we've got a a lot of these like kind of sprawling, you know, especially outside of some of the major like metropolitan areas. We've got a lot of sprawling area. And I always thought it, it would be nice to have like a public funded sort of like roving fleet of self-driving vehicles that you could just have come and pick you up and drop you off at the doctor's office or whatever. Like a train? (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, yeah, except for the fact that like, you know, not everybody lives near a train station, especially as mobility decreases. Yeah. It's the fact it goes that last mile to your house. That's the difference. This is a solvable problem though. You just build more train stations. You can't build a train station at everyone's house. Not everyone can have that. I mean, yeah, but how easy is it to, like, retrofit an entire country versus, like... I mean, I agree. I think it's ideal that we build, like, trains everywhere, right? But, like, in the meantime, I think that, like, it could help to have something like that. That's all I'm saying. We retrofitted this country to be car dependent, right? Like, we went back... Like, we were a train-dependent country, and then we were just like, now nah, let's go try this automobile thing, well, which has been just a massive failure. And now we're kind of trapped with it for a bit. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Stop gap only. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is, we got to break the backwards compatibility for car dependency here. I think too, because, you know, there are a lot of real dumb, dumb things about car dependence in America. Like I've just watched, uh, there's this YouTube channel called Climate Town and they had a video that came out, I think yesterday, really great on uh, parking minimums in the country and how the entire idea of it's just BS and they've done no real studies and they're just kind of like, we're just gonna pick some arbitrary numbers to decide how many minimum parking spots you need and how it's not just like, turning giant spaces of land into asphalt for no reason. It's also like making us destroy buildings that we don't need to destroy, making so entire areas of town are just devoid of business, not because people don't want to do business, but because they can't afford to build parking lots. And it's like increasing the cost of things in some cases by like hundreds of millions of dollars just to have this freely available parking. And I feel like the thing we should be doing is being like, okay, get rid of all of that free parking and just like get us as far as fast as possible away from cars. And I think maybe this maybe this is an unpopular opinion, make it painful to live in suburbs because suburbs are fundamentally unsustainable entities and we need to get away from them. And we're not gonna get away from them if we still if we if we make it too easy for people to keep living in them, they will keep living in them. Also, you know, that could help solve some of our racism problems. That's a whole entirely different story. Oh, man, I'm so happy I I brought out such a divisive opinion. I'm just enjoying this. (laughs) Yeah, I think one thing that I would like to see more of in cities is fewer cars. Yes, more zip lines. There's a lot of for sure. There's a lot of places that are very accessible with zip wires. As long as we get over this nanny state, kind of worried about people falling to their doom. Plummeting. Yeah. 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 We have to get over that. I live on a hill that is close to another hill. It would be great if we could just zip or or gondola, if you want to be a little safer, Mm -hmm. gondola over to uh, the other hill. It would be great. You know, there's nothing like a nice, like, cucumber sandwich in a gondola to, like, really. There you go. Convey yourself in style. Yeah, it'll be the next uh, the next big skyline addition to Seattle. I think will be the, the 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 Capitol Hill Queen Anne gondola. You heard it here first. I think those they're just too slow. Those things. I get it. You know, Andy, you strike me as a gentleman like from the fifties. You like to sit down and have a nice sandwich with the crusts cut off and high noon and t- and all that stuff. It's somehow posher than me, and I'm British. Andy. Uh, high tea. High tea. I mean, if you want to go fast, man, you just take the subway, right? You take the gondola when you want to, like, you have a little bit of time. You want to want to do something scenic. Zip wire. You can have a can on the zip wire on your way down, as long as you drink it quick. You can definitely, you can, you can, 
Well, there'll be a zip too. Yeah. E- either one. Okay. Yeah. Because the other one is catapult. Yeah. That's one we've not really explored yeah. much. We don't really have the time. wire budgets just going through the roof on this. I'm telling you. Yeah. The, I mean, they tried a trebuchet and they, you know, they just just won that. You just want to be able to go and go go to your local one. You just strap in. It's like right, everyone ready? Yeah. Okay. So you go into Euston <laughs> Station. Off you go. Pull the thing. Flang. You go flying through the air. There's a net and all that on the other end to catch you. And you just, or you, you get caught in big funnels and then you just go down these tubes. Checking your watch on the way down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can have a drink. You know, New York spent a lot of money to get rid of all of the cabling and nonsense out of our, out of our skies. Bring we should, it back. We should not bring it back. <laughs> I was just thinking about one winter with all the snow and all that stuff coming down. Like, oh, or, you know, it's going to be like icy one day and there'll be some fools trying to zip line all over the place. There are just, there are so many issues. I feel like Andy had a comment about what I said, though. I feel like he's... Oh, you mean the suburbs thing? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Um, on the one hand, I there is a part of me that like kind of deeply agrees with you and how they're, the city layout is fundamentally racist in a lot of ways and uh, all that sort of stuff. But like the other thing that it made me think of was like, you know, Judge Dredd, like not the stupid movie, but like the original comic was like, I, I just, it, everybody like basically the world heats up and everybody goes into these, either these huge mega cities or they go out and they live in like the desert and, you know, eat people or whatever. And it's just, you know, I just, I can't, I don't want to, even though I like, I, I mean, I live in like the suburbiest suburb that's ever suburbed, Columbia, Maryland, you know, shout out to the people tree. But um, I don't want to like believe that. I want to believe that we can have like better, broader kind of public transit solutions that can work for like everybody, no matter where you live. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, there's a middle ground too. It's like, I'm not saying everybody should live in a city. Like, no, I think we should just have like sustainable suburbs, the walkable suburbs, right. Yeah. Where you can like, well, we do have that walk in. Yeah. yeah. The thing I don't like is when you have like really spread out stuff and everybody has a yard for some reason and a lot of single family homes, like that's the stuff I'm like, mm. but if you have nice walkable suburbs, oh, Ohio. And, well, yeah, like yeah. upstate New York, tons of places. <laughs> I think if it's like a nice walkable place where it's like, People should be able to live without a car in this country. Like most people shouldn't need to have a car. If you want to have a car, great. You want to drive, great. You should incur the expense of that. We shouldn't subsidize you. And I feel like all of the dumping of money into driverless cars is just like, yeah, another thing to enable people to continue having cars when it's like, well. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I was coming at it from the complete opposite direction. Like I was. I was seeing it as not like a like a, a rich person or like a, a get, make more cars, but as actually a way to have less. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, no, it will only. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be possible for me to walk anymore when everybody's got a self driving car that can just run me yeah, over. And I suppose that's true. Like how how unfun is it going to be for me as a pedestrian? When it's now illegal for me to you know cross the street because I might stop a self driving car. Yeah. That's what they'll do. They'll make it illegal to walk. Well, or you, let's be honest. You're not stopping any of those things. They're death machines. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd really like to see like self-driving cars trying to operate in New York City. Like, I either they they'd hit people or they just cause massive traffic jams. Either way, they'd probably get banned pretty quickly. Mm. Yeah, you need to go all in. A cars an amendment yet? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Basically, in the, everybody's got the constitutional right to ha- to must own a car. <laughs> I just wanted to be put on the record that I'm not arguing for big auto here. Like, I just yeah. want <laughs> Alice kind of was earlier by saying, uh, well, no, you weren't, were you, Alice? I think, I think she was arguing for a big train. Yeah. Right? Bring back the railroad barons. No, just kidding. Please don't. <laughs> I mean, you can have small small train. I don't know. I was just in Europe for the first time. How small, though? Because you've got to fit a lot of people in. Might be fine for you, Alice. Oh, a small train? Yeah. I mean, I don't have that problem. Exactly. That's you know, not that's fair. A, that's a problem for people who are big. I don't know what that is. That's not very good dev user experience thinking. It's a bit selfish. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, no, no. I just mean, you know, I I mean, there is kind of like well, large, more like um, interstate or intercity kind of train. And then there's more like inner city you know like within a city kind of transit in that in that respect and you can have more of one or the other i think investing in both is a, is a good option of course then you can also um have some competition for the airlines that way now oh now i can get to la or whatever and i don't have to fly if i don't want to big catapult uh, i would love the vacuum zippy 
if that had actually really been a yeah thing. the hyperloop thing oh. you could do it you could do a lo-fi version of that with just vacuum cleaners and zorbing balls i think yeah, yeah go from seattle to san diego yeah. just just zorb your way down oh, i'm <laughs> catching the zorb down to san diego it's so cool i'll be like oh, i'm going to go for kind everyone's zorbing everywhere yeah <laughs> i'm zorbing my way <laughs> Well, or, or travelators, or change all the sidewalks to be just travelators. Is that what they're called over there? We call them, I think we call them people movers over here. Anyway. People movers. Oh, do you? Yeah. People movers. I, I changed the sidewalks. We don't call it that. This is so difficult. I'm outvoted uh, <laughs> on what language I have to use today. So pavement, we call it, not sidewalk. So I would say tra- turn the travelators into a pavement, or for the US edition, you might say turn the sidewalks into people movers <laughs> movers yeah, i don't know how you do that i don't know how you do the accent all day it's exhausting <laughs> yeah pronouncing all of our r's yeah. you know what someone's got to do it uh, you yeah. spend so much time doing that though not putting u's in random places <laughs> properly spelling things that have z in them you know. <laughs> yeah uh, s and z are two different letters matt i agree yeah so is z <laughs> Hmm. I've actually oh. almost forgotten my unpopular it, opinion. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. You better remember it. Can we do a linguistics episode? I'd love that one. Oh, there's a linguistics guy on TikTok that I absolutely love. He's the one that made me realize that in English, uh, words that start with TR are pronounced like CH. So if you say choo choo train, like the, the, you don't pronounce the T in train like T, it's CH, which is very weird when you think about it. Same thing with like trombone and all of this. Trombone. Yeah, yeah. It's called cha cha cha. Choo train. Oh yeah, it's it's de- it's a phonetic. It's f- it's actually dependent on like the adjacent words and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's because that's how we say T and R. You can't like the, your tongue is in the wrong part of your mouth to go from yeah. T to R. So we change how we pronounce yes. the T. It's all yeah. Yeah. It's fun. How do you say burgers? I don't understand that word burger. Burgers. There you go. I can I can understand it. I didn't realize you could speak properly, Andy. You know, it is thought that, uh, you know, British British English used to have uh, R's, like American R's, and then you dropped them. Yeah. And we're like the vestige of how English used to be. Yeah, you're, bringing it, you're bringing them back and making them cool again. Non-rotic, yeah, is new. Mm. Also, burger is a weird thing, because it's just like we decided to break up a word, not where it's supposed to be broken up. Right. Because it's uh, hamburger is a sandwich from Hamburg, and we're just like, we'll just take off the ham and do burger, because that's obviously mm. how it's supposed to be. It's the American way. That's like, I think I was watching something one day. It's got some very American sounds in it, too. Er, er. Er. Like, that is very, uh, very much an like a American sound. Yeah, it really is. In fact, the, the English R sound is one of, you know, it's a pretty rare sound across languages. Like, mm. I can't off the top of my head think of another language that actually has the same R sound we do. Don't know. Yeah, good old America. Yeah, no. yeah. I was watching a TikTok the other day where, so, where someone was like, oh, name an American food. And people, and someone just said French fries. And the person <laughs> just looked at them like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Anyway, we are way off track. Andy. Just like a train. All right. My, my unpopular opinion is that um, most programming fonts suck. Mm. Mm. As much as like I love their design and I love to talk about design, I still like I get obsessed with a new one every like few weeks, but like I have just never found one that I can like really, truly stand for very long. Like I'm I have astigmatism. So like basically everything is just a little bit (laughs) fuzzy to me. And so like I have to go to great lengths to make sure that like contrast and stuff. Anyway, once you start to make things out of vectors, precision really does kind of go out the window. Hard edges kind of go out the window and you have to like really, really increase your resolution and, 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 and whatnot. And even then sometimes like, you know, the difference of a, a single, you know, unit of screen movement can make something blurry or not depending on mm-hmm. the aliasing. Yeah. Yeah. But yet you turn it off and there's nothing that is built for being run without aliasing and everything looks like garbage. So like I, I, there's a handful of fonts that I've used that are fine without aliasing. Andy, do you tweet your font adventures? I don't know. Oh. I should. Yeah. I, I I think the most recent one I was fascinated with, like if you've got a good like PDF with like your, your design layout in it, I'm, I'm a sucker for that, especially if it's got color chips, of course. But yeah, I think the most recent one I was I'm fascinated with was Berkeley mono. Oh yeah. Mono. Yeah. It's doing, it's doing, it's doing all right, but Mm-mm. most of them suck. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, we'll see. 
Most fonts suck programming. Yeah. Most programming fonts suck. Most of the dedicated ones that they say are good for programming. Yeah. Like, we'll make it a little bit more unpopular. Mm. All right. I got my hard stop right now, but okay. thanks for having me on. It was lots of fun. I'd love to come back, and I feel like I have so much more content. Like, I also have some follow-up questions for you at some point if like, if you're on the yeah. Gopher Slack or something. Uh, or email me or, yeah. I'm yeah. pretty findable, I think. Thanks, Alice. I'll do yeah. a little outro now, uh, but you feel free to go. Cheers. Bye. Uh, maybe this won't be unpopular, but I'm going to give a reason that will hopefully make it unpopular. I think that we need to uh, abandon calling the science computer science, and we need to call it computing. Oh, this is a good one. No more computer science. It's a stupid name. Like, it's not the science of computers. It's the science of computing. And no other science calls itself something science. Not biology or geology or chemistry or physics. None of them. They're all like, we got our names. So we should just call it computing. Rocket science. Oh, and I, there is that. But I do, can I, you've reminded me of a beautiful anecdote. So a while back, I don't know what got me on this, but I was like, what is the history of the term like computer scientists and programmer, like where does, mm. where did we come up with that? And so that's where my, like, uh, so, okay, anyway, I went digging and I found the first mention of the term, like software engineer or something like that, or, or programmer. Now I can't remember exactly what the first mention, but, but I thought it was an old like letter to the editor for the ACM where they were like talking about what to call people who do this programming thing. And there was this guy that wrote in with these amazing suggestions, right? And like tour engineer, tourologist, you know, <laughs> some really interesting stuff. And so I was like, in, but my favorite was at the very end was flow charts, man, with like dashes between each one. I was like, that's it. That's, uh, the new, that's my new. And that's your Twitter name, I isn't it? it? We, yeah. 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 Flow charts, man. <laughs> so I, I think there's like, we do have, there is some prior art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like the reason, like I've been, I've been studying uh, computing recently because I've also fallen down like another rabbit hole that uh, maybe I'll do an episode about it. I'm, I'm planning to write some blog posts and some articles on, around it. So maybe we can do episodes of that. But I fall on, because I asked myself the other day, I'm like, what does it mean to compute? Like, what is computing? Like, what is this thing that we do? And it actually turned out to be like a pretty simple answer. It's like, you know, there's two things. It's like, you know, something is computable if you can find an answer to it using computation, which is just an algorithm. Uh, and then there's also the complexity, which we all love to talk about and nerd out about and be complete and all of that. Also, like there's this thing about feasibility of complexity where it goes into like, well, if you had an Earth sized computer that existed for about the same time that Earth has existed, this would be the maximum type of problem you could solve mm. with that. And I'm like, that is such a ridiculous, but also <laughs> nerdy way to like put the top at a feasibility. Mm. But the kind of extension to that whole, like, we should go back to calling it computing, like, one of the reasons I want us to do that, because I want us to remember our roots, because I feel like with AI, we've fallen into a thing we believed at the end of the 19th century, which was that it was possible that every single problem you could ask, every single question you could ask is a computable, right? You can find an answer for it. And we got computing and computers because multiple people like Kurt Godel, Alan Turing, Alonzo Church, like all of these different people all discovered in different ways how absolutely wrong that idea was. You can't, there are things that are uncomputable. There are questions that are unanswerable. And that, you know, launched us into, you know, what we have now. And I feel like there's a little bit of people believing this kind of in the AI world that it's like computers can do anything and they can do everything. And they're going to be these magnificent, all knowing, all intelligent machines. And it's like, we've been here and we proved that wrong. <laughs> like there are significant limits to what is computable and what you can do with computing. I, I want us to shift away from that thought and be like, well, let's try and figure out how to answer useful computable or actually computable problems instead of mm. being obsessed with, oh, we're, this thing's going to be able to take over everything. And maybe, you know, that whole like Turologist thing uh, reminded me of how how much I, I dislike Alan Turing <laughs> ever since, you know, I found out that the Turing test was a reaction to Ada Lovelace's assertion that like people are just going to be fooled by computers because they're kind of silly, um, which is what we, you know, we figured out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like, if we're going to call 
call it something, we should base it on what she said because she was like a hundred years earlier and also a brilliant woman. <laughs> so we should love Letitian or something like that. I don't know, but <laughs> oh, there you go. That's a nice. That's a lovely candidate there. Yeah. I would that'd be epic though if you were just like, oh, what do you do? It's like I'm a love letitian. Yeah, that does sound like someone would say that at a party. I would like saying yeah. that actually. <laughs> I would put that on my business yeah. card. It doesn't sound like what you think it sounds like. I think it doesn't sound like your job is coding. It's better than being an atheist. I'll say that. Yeah, like yeah, that's. <laughs> and I, I do feel when I was thinking about like we should call it, we should call back to calling it computing. I was a little bit like computist that's no like i don't know what no. we'd call the people that study and do the science of computing well i mean they did call they just called them computers right that's what they were that's what they were called back when uh back when uh computation was women's work you know and yeah like the engineers but they were actually doing yeah they were actually doing computation whereas it's like that's like the computing is like the science of it. Like the, I got into a whole argument or not argument. I got a whole discussion with one of my friends about like, what is science versus applied science versus engineering? And it turned into this, this whole <laughs> interesting thing that also might make an interesting episode to talk about. We will um, see. We will see. But unfortunately we genuinely have run out of time. Um, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Thank you so much to our panel there. We learned, didn't we, about the developer experience, how important this is. Alice, I think a quote from her was, developers are people too. So we want to care about their experience as well. And we had a lot of food analogies. We talked about French omelets, yeah. uh, ice cream, fat and sugary features, trains, spicing or roasting veggies. We talked a lot about cookies. And Alice, of course, mentioned automatic sliced bread. I never did. I'm sorry, Andy, did you? He said food analogies and you said trains. And I'm. Well, I know. I thought we were. No, I thought we were going along the list of different sorts of analogies. We <laughs> oh, made, okay. But no, he was staying with food. And then I just threw trains right in the middle of it. And it was awful. No, it was awful. good. It's fine. I thought you meant like, here comes the train. Choo choo. That's how you still eat. <laughs> It comes the food train. Yeah, that's the only way you can eat. No, I thought yeah. in the restaurants like, don't look at me. I thought we were listing the analogies we'd done. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we also had automatic sliced bread. We'd never found out what that meant. It's very good. Automatic sliced bread. Oh, like the, the the sliced bread that you buy. Right. But what do you mean automatic? The bread's not sliced itself, has it? It means you're not slicing it. Like it's uh, it's odd when it comes to you. It's already been. It's like automatic. that's what sliced bread is. That is, yeah. I think she was probably getting to like the, you know, I, it it def automatic sliced bread definitely sounds like one of those like like, UX in jokes, right? Like the yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's we've had sliced bread. You just manually had to slice it. Like the innovative thing was that it all, it came no. sliced already. <laughs> no. Yeah, the sliced bread. It's what makes it sliced is the fact that it's been <laughs> cut into slices. Yes. I don't think the first one, no, it, it, the first, the, the best thing. Why are we digging on this? Well, the best thing since, you know, sliced bread, let's assume uh, it's the best thing, right? That's what we're told. It's the best thing since sliced bread. It's the best thing since like you could buy sliced bread, which is, you know, automatically sliced no, bread by some machine. It probably wasn't. But you think, <laughs> you think we started selling sliced bread as like someone was in the back just slicing bread themselves? Yes. Yeah, I literally do. Yeah. I think that's... I hope they don't cut any of this out. Why? Like, every, every... They did that where I grew, when I grew up, Chris. Even in my living memory, uh, they would you'd go to the bakery and then you'd order a loaf and they'd slice it for you. And they just do it by hand. Hand sliced. None of this automatic sliced. I, I feel like that's not like the innovation that's amazing. I feel like if you wanted it in the past, that would have been very expensive. So like the innovation is that anybody, even poor people, could buy sliced bread because... You aren't having to do manual labor to slice it because it's a machine that's doing it automatically. Yeah, it's just, it's the saying is it's the best thing since sliced bread, which was almost certainly yeah. sliced manually. I think automatic sliced bread. What? Why would that be like an innovation though? <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not the one that goes around saying that's the best thing since sliced bread. I don't really say that ever because <laughs> uh, I don't think sliced bread's that good. Like, you know. Oh God, we're going to have a whole episode on sliced <laughs> bread now. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I get, if I accidentally buy a loaf, I stick it all back together, so it's just one big loaf again. I don't want. I unslice it. I'm not having any of that. You're a loaf purist. Just man. make a big sandwich with it, man, many layers deep. So we learned about ca we learned about uh, developer experience and why it's important, and we heard some great stories and some tips there. Thank you so much, Alice Merrick. 
Andy Walker, and of course, Chris Brando. Pleasure as always. Pleasure's always ours. See you next time on Go Time. That is Go Time for this week. Unless, of course, you are a Changelog Plus Plus subscriber. For you, we have a bonus six minutes of Matt trying to break the ice with each panelist before the actual show began. If Changelog Plus Plus is news to you, that's our membership program, which lets you directly support our work, ditch the ads from all of our pods, and get fun bonuses like this extended episode. Learn more about it at changelog.com slash plus plus. Thanks again to our partners for helping us bring you go time each and every week. Fastly.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. And to Breakmaster Cylinder for hooking us up with the best beats and all the biz. That's all from me, but we'll talk to you again next time on GoTime.